old. I did a lecture last year. Uh, some of you might have been there. I did the active shooter con thing for last year. Um, and I wanted to come back up this year for a couple different reasons. And when I called the um, regional office, I said, I want to do something really different outside the box. I'm not, I hate, I like getting lectures, but I hate being a student and just sitting there listening to somebody. Well, we're not doing that today. All right, don't get that out of the way. I have to let you know, though, this is a two-part session. You have to get, you don't have to go to both parts, but to get the second part, you really get to understand what we're doing here today, all right? The second part is tomorrow, I believe, at 9 o'clock. It's part two, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Both of them are hand, we're not, we're not doing any lectures, well, a little bit here and there, but not much. This is a crime scene investigation kind of a deal. Uh, one of my duties in the Philadelphia Fire Department is I'm in charge of QI, quality improvement. So I read a lot of documents, obviously. And uh, the stuff that I see is really horrendous. And if you ever have to go to court, you're really going to get screwed. Because what happens is they're going to call you out five years later and go, you need to be a witness. And everybody in this room is a professional witness. Whether you're an EMT, a medic, volunteer, or paid, it doesn't matter. You're a professional witness according to the court. So you may be going to court. Some of you might have already been to court and you probably learned a few lessons while you were there. Hmm. Um, this is basically to prepare you a little bit better to, to document real crime scene. Um, I have set up a mock crime scene. It's in the other room. And what we're going to do here is we're going to go out and check it out. Now, once we all go through the crime scene, I'm going to give you, break you up in groups of about 10 because it's a fairly small room and the rest of you can just sit on the side for a little bit. And then when you're done, just come back to the room and then we'll finish up what we're going to do after that. You all work for Smallville EMS. You're going to be dispatched to a call, um, sick unknown. I want to keep it that generic. And you're going to be going to an address 123 North Broad Street on today's date. That's all you know. There are no police on the scene. Just you, yourself, and eventually I'm going to pick a partner for you. When you get back here, you're going to be writing a narrative for a report. I don't want anybody taking any notes because you will have a patient, and I'll tell you which one's going to be your patient, which should be pretty obvious, but we'll leave that one alone. Um, you will be transporting somebody, so you, I'm not worried about documentation for that, but I want to explain to you what we're going to do with all the stuff you see today is going to go to court tomorrow. And I have a mock court set up for you. My partner in crime and my job is a lawyer. He's going to play the nasty defense attorney. I'm going to be the judge. The rest of you guys are going to be role playing. I'm going to pick people out of the room to be everything from the coroner, the police officer, the bailiff, the DA. Everybody's going to have a job. I have this whole thing scripted out. And I want to see how it plays out. Now, a couple things here is number one, this has never been done as far as I know of any conference. I've been in EMS for 45 years. I've seen a lot of conferences. Um, I've never seen anybody do a two-day, kind of a part one, part two, unless it's the same topic. Um, th so my whole thing here is, A, number one, we have some fun doing this. And B, number two, if you walk away learning something from this while you're having fun, then we both achieve something. And that's all I'm doing here. I'm just more of a facilitator than an educator. Does that make any sense? All right. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, let me go check and see if my... Uh,
for right. two reasons. Number one, anything you wrote on here, this is a legal document now. So when you go to court five years from now, which we're going to speed up into one day, I can do that. That's something, whatever. Um, they're going to give you this back, and you'll be able to read from it in testimony. And believe me, what you wrote down could make or break a case. Trust me. I've been to too many of them, and I've seen the damages done on both sides, or the benefits done on both sides. All right? Um, the purpose of tomorrow is it's going to be a group discussion kind of a deal once we get it through the court. I'm going to hand you out what I call my basic things to remember at a crime scene. And we're going to talk about a few of them over the next couple of minutes. All right? See what you documented and what you didn't document out of the stuff I'm going to give you. All right? Does that make any sense? Here, we'll just, whatever. I got plenty of them, so. A crime scene, and not every case you'll be able to figure that out, but the obvious ones that we just saw was an obvious crime scene. Once you recognize it's a crime scene, you need to limit the amount of people in the room. All right? That's the first and foremost thing. I'm, like, for instance, the uh, O.J. Simpson trial was totally messed up by first responders. They walked through blood, they added footprints, they added evidence, the whole nine yards got OJ the, the trial that he wanted, all right? Um, so we gotta be really careful. The number one priority is always patient care, but the second priority is seen in crime preservation. And anything you do can be used in the chain of custody kind of stuff, all right? For instance, um, it's on here. I'm not going to go through any major orders. When you cut people's clothes off, please don't cut them off through a hole in the garment because that will ruin evidence because they can figure out trajectories by garments. Never put a sheet over anybody. I don't know why we keep freaking doing it. I mean, it looks good in the horror movies, but in real life, we should stop putting sheets over people because you're introducing more evidence into the crime scene. So when they look at the body, they're gonna find these little white fibers and they're gonna to try to figure out, ooh, maybe the, the criminal had something white on. No, it's the freaking white sheet that you put on. I like, so we gotta stop doing that. The other thing you gotta stop doing, and I know everybody does it, is everybody takes whatever's bloody and body fluids off that person and throw it into a red garment plastic bag. That's the wrong thing to do. Because if you don't understand, if you put it in a plastic bag, it can't dry where it is. It'll actually expand, and it ruins the marks on the shirt, the pants, whatever you have to have, OK? All those things should be put in a, in a paper bag. So when it dries, it dries in the shape that it was the whole pattern after the crime scene. All right? And I know we, and we still do it. We're still using red plastic bags. We're still using white sheets. And this is why people get off for killing people and whatever the cases may be. Um, if you're going into the area, always walk in the same way you walk out. Because that way you can document that you walked in this way and you walked out this way kind of stuff. Instead of walking all around the place, whatever the case may be. If you walked into that scenario and your job is two patients, all right, scene safety, that was taken care of, blah, blah, blah. The police arrive right after you get there. That's taken care of. So now you have two patients to worry about. So you're going to check the guy who was shot. All right, you're going to find out he's asystolic on a monitor, and you're going to pronounce him. That's fine. Then you have the other lady. That is, you don't want to move the guy that was shot. The only time you move a body is if you can't get to somebody who's viable. All right, if you check him and roll him over, you need to document that you found him on whatever side, in whatever position, whatever, whatever, and you rolled them over to whatever so it's on paper so they can figure out when the pooling starts and all that kind of stuff. You don't want to screw that kind of thing up. Um, let me see here. Don't touch anything. I can't tell you, well, it's, it's, it's not as prevalent today as it used to be, but we, when we used to make medical command calls, we actually used the phone inside the crime room. 
well, how do you know that somebody just didn't use it and you just messed up the fingerprints? And if you didn't notice, there was a phone in the room and it was off the hook. And the female in the room is the one that called 911. I will let you know that. All right? Um, that's all I'm going to you know. So that phone, if you would have touched it or moved it, it would have been, you would have disturbed the crime scene. All right? So you, get, you really don't want to touch anything. Don't touch any bullet casings and definitely don't ever touch a weapon. Most of you, I'd say 99.9% .9 of you in the room are not ballistic experts. Don't pick up a gun and move it from point A to point B because that's when you're going to get shot because you don't know how to handle a gun. That's not your job. All right? And on top of that, you're going to mess up fingerprints and blood on it and whatever happens to be on the weapon itself. Uh, we already talked about that. Don't walk through any blood on the scene. I already talked about that. Document what you see, what you smell. I was going to put some odor in the air, and I actually didn't remember it this morning, like some orange stuff, because that odor could actually mean something. I'm not the forensic expert, but they may be able to figure out, mm, you know, this is a combination of this. But, you know, you can hear what I'm talking about. The other thing I want you to understand is anything you hear in the back of an ambulance from a victim, a witness, or a criminal, if you ever have one of them, Dying confessions need to be documented. If anybody tells you, I just killed them, you need to put that in your chart. When you get off the truck, you need to let the police know that this guy passed away in the back of my truck while we tried to get him to the hospital, blah, blah, blah. He stated to me, quote, unquote, I killed Mary, whatever, the, whatever they said. You need to document everything. If the witness said something, or two people talking, you hear them say something, you never write your opinion. And I, I tell us for every time I tell people about charts, don't ever put down the patient you know, is intoxicated. You have no clue they're intoxicated. You're not again, you don't have a lab there to check their sugars and everything else. You appear, you act like this, you look like this, no opinions, just straight facts. It's 10 o'clock in the morning, it's whatever the case may be. This is the biggest one on this. Never document entrance or exit wound. You're not a ballistic expert. And to the day, JFK's assassination has never been really clear because they're still fighting over what's the entrance wounds and what's the exit wounds and how many years ago was that. All right? So do you really want to be in that kind of a situation? Everything, I don't care if it's a stab wound, a puncture wound, a gunshot wound, an arrow, whatever it happens to be, it's wound one, two, three, four, five, and six. You need to describe where wound one is, two, three, four, five, and six. You're not an expert. So when you go to court, they're going to say, okay, whatever. Um, you, you, you saw this guy shot, correct? Yes. How many times was he shot? So you look at report. Um, he's got wound number one, he's got wound number two, wound number three. Sir, I have three wounds. Well, how many times was he shot? I have no idea because I'm not a ballistics expert. I'm just telling you, I saw three wounds on his body. See what I'm talking about? There's a difference there. And there's a difference in this case. Hmm, I'm not letting you know the answer until tomorrow. But you better not have documented how many bullets were shot and how many wounds were on it because they didn't add up. All right, um, let me see here. What else do we have here? Never document. I already talked about that. Dying confessions, cut clothes off. Trace evidence, yeah. Trace evidence can be lost during transport. Things can fall out of their bo off their body, a watch, a phone, whatever. The other thing is don't touch the people's cell phones because they, they're going to take that and trace it back to the last call they made, incoming and outgoing, any messages that they wrote you know, I'm going to kill myself kind of message on the phone. You really don't want to tamper with that stuff. That's evidence you need to collect and give it to an authority once you get to the hospital. All right? Um, and, the, and the below, I, I just wrote down some common things that are um, actually evidence at a crime scene. You know, blood hair, semen, saliva, urine, clothing, condoms, hmm. <clears throat> bedding, fingerprints, shoe prints, cell phones. I just got done talking about them. Wallets, purses, IDs, and any personal items, you need to put them all together and hand them in. Because the problem is, again, that chain of evidence. What's going to happen is, 
A watch shows up. I don't know where. In ICU, a watch shows up. All right, well, how did the watch get from the crime scene to ICU? There's no documentation that you guys took it off, you gave it to a nurse, and a nurse gave it to the police department. See what I'm talking about? If that's not, that's part of the crime scene. Uh, you know, I'm not saying it's the weapon, but that's chain of evidence kind of stuff. You know, if they lose a piece of clothing, you know, the guy had two socks on, and now they can't find the socks. Well, socks are evidence for 101 reasons. So again, you, you don't want to lose, if anything you have, you want to hand it off and document, hand it evidence to Nurse Smith, Officer Jones, get their payroll number, blah, 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 and everything's documented because that way when it goes to court, you can justify, I handed a watch, a cell phone, a wallet, and driver's license to Nurse Brackett and Rampart General at 10.03 p.m., whatever. I'm done, all right? You need to document that. And again, we already talked about bullets, restraints, and gags. Hmm. All right. In the city, we see a lot of that stuff. Um, trace evidence, broken glass is trace evidence. If you walk into a room and a window is broken, do not step on the glass because you're going to make it break more and you just ruin the evidence because they can figure out the patterns if the guy came in through the window or he left through the window by how the glass is broken, how it's positioned on the floor. That can all be figured out. That's really cool stuff that they can do this stuff. Um, you know, paint, environmental debris, whatever it may be, even trash, don't pick up the trash can, don't throw anything away, don't, whatever the case may be. And many other things need to be considered. And there is a lot of evidence in that crime scene. And we're going to go through all of it tomorrow after we do the crime scene. Now, I'm hoping everybody will be able to join us for tomorrow. All right. Um, I will pick out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick out two reports tonight. Oh, all right. Oh, God. That's the worst. <laughs> and no, I'm, they're not going to be both good. I'm going to hopefully try to find somebody intermediate and somebody that, you know, this is a learning session. I'm not there to embarrass somebody. All right. Um, it's more of a, I want to see how you react because, you know, the DA is going to be really nice. The defense attorney will not be so nice. I will tell you what the charges are, who's the victims. All that stuff will be revealed tomorrow, all right? And at the end of the court tomorrow, I will explain the entire incident and how it went down. And then that way you guys can talk. I don't care. You can talk about it tonight, like, you know, compare, compare notes, like, what do you guys think? You know, that's, that's good educational stuff. You're supposed to talk about that. Not how many, who's going to buy the next round? You should be talking about my stuff. I know my priorities are a little screwed up. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll vouch for that. Um, is there any questions of what we did today and what we're planning on doing tomorrow? Yes, sir. Just in general, the, what would be the recommendation for an EMS group coming on scene finding a crime scene with no police? Okay, well, every... You, there. Well, again, priority is your safety and then patient care. If you think your safety is an, is an issue, then you stay away. If, for instance, you notice the gun's there, she's catatonic, he looks like he's dead, well, it doesn't look like there's anybody in need of EMS right now, you may want to just back out and wait for police, let them show up, and that kind of a sense, I would have let them show up and then walked in after they walked in, and then let me take care of the young lady because he looks like he's dead, kind of stuff, all right? But again, you have to make sure he's dead. I can't tell you, I've had people with 20 gunshot wounds to their body, and they live. And I'm talking about large caliber guns. I ain't talking about a 22. I'm talking about something good, nine millimeter or bigger. Huh? How many tattoos do they have? Yeah, well, yeah, it's true. But, you know, again, your safety is number one. And I always say that. If you don't feel safe, you know, everybody makes, everybody's got their own policies. Once you hear, maybe you got a report, came back, and dispatch tells you that you had, they, um, somebody called up and they thought they heard a gunshot wound coming from that building, well, you know, our protocol is we stop a block away, we're not even going in, all right? Everybody's got their own protocols, but again, scene safety is your precedence, and then you go from there. And then crime scene preservation is like number three on the list, all right? Whatever you can do to help the police, because I'm gonna to talk to you, well, you know what, let me, let me give you an example, for instance, how documentation is important. Two real quick, what time is it anyway? It's probably almost time, right? 
All right. If you guys got two minutes, I'll give you two scenarios. These are two court cases that I had out on. I'm not telling you how many. Um, <clears throat> but both cases, one sentence on my documentation made the case. My report, not the, not the coroner's, not the police report, my one sentence in my patient care report broke the case. Number one, <clears throat> a fire job, went on a job, um, multiple people trapped in the house, it was a single family dwelling, the thing was ripping when we got there, blah, 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 blah. We found one of the teenage daughters behind the house in the, in the, like, the yard behind the house. And she was complaining, she, her ankle was messed up. And her story was that she jumped from the second floor, because it was like two o'clock in the morning, she was sleeping, jumped out of the second floor window, and ran away from the house that was burning. Her injuries sounded true. You know, she screwed up her ankle jumping from the second floor window. All right. Unfortunately, I made the second floor, and when I made the second floor, the window of her bedroom was shut. How do you close your window when you jump out of it? Me remembering that and writing that down, I broke the window for ventilation, put her in jail for the rest of her life for killing four family members. Originally, we thought she was a victim. She was the murderer. And my one sentence put her away for life. No other evidence. Mine. All right? Number two, a really bad car accident. A tractor trailer went up and over a guardrail on an expressway, ran into a small pickup truck, killed the driver instantly, trapped the passenger. It took three rescue companies two hours to get this guy out from underneath the truck, so you can imagine how messed up this dude was. He lived. But we also found a dog dead in the front seat. I made the comment that the driver was found, blah, 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 whatever I said it, with his arm wrapped around the dog. The person that was representing the family of the deceased won $20 million for a wrongful death suit from the trucking company because they could show pain and suffering because of my one sentence in the report that said, found him with his arm around the dog. They said, that he saw the truck coming at the last second and grabbed the dog. That showed pain and suffering, and so it went from a $2 million lawsuit to a $20 million lawsuit because of one sentence in my patient care report. So you can make a difference. You can make a case, or you can ruin a case for somebody. And I'll leave you with that note. Thank you, and have a nice day. First of all, after I got done reading all those reports last night, or yesterday afternoon, I had to go out to get a couple shots of fireball. <laughs> We're going to make some comments at the end. I wanted to save the comments about the trip sheets in general because I think it will ruin the mood of the court. Because some of the things we want to talk about we should be covering during the court proceedings kind of deal. Um, I did pick out two reports yesterday. There was a lot more I could have picked from, but I wanted to draw a few points home. Now, I want to find out if there's anybody in here that's going to have a problem if I call your name to come up. It doesn't mean your report was bad, but there's things in the report that are, like, could help a, de a defense or help a DA's case. All right, and that's, I'll leave it at that. Nobody's going to have a problem if I call your name. All right, so the two EMTs. Oh, <laughs> Um, it doesn't either one or mine because it's too long. Too long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Maria Cameron, come on up. You're, you're the winner. Just have a seat somewhere. Just grab a seat. <laughs> we'll just put you over here for now. The hot seat. The hot seat. Well, no. No, it's not a hot seat. That's only lukewarm. It's only lukewarm. Hot seat. Like some hot seat up front. You're hot. Your person. Yeah. Wait till you get up front. That'll be the hot seat. Don't be nervous now. You're sweating all over the place. And uh, John, Pet, Trish. Yeah. <laughs> all right. There he is. There we go. Are you guys? Are oh, you done? You got all your questions? Hi. Hi. <laughs> all right. Now, I need a volunteer 
There's going to be a good DA. They have a lot of work to do. I need a DA. I'm retired. Well, come on up. <laughs> You're my DA. All right, I need a police officer. Do we have any police officers in the room? Yes. <laughs> Right there? there you oh, okay, nice. Oh, you know what? There's DJ. Right there. Right there, Alfie. You're going to be my bailiff, and you're going to be my police officer. So. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. And I need, I need, one, more, I need one more person at the corner. Right there in the back of the room. Come on up. This is Philly court, I'm bringing my coffee. Now, <laughs> I need 10 jurors. We're in Philly court. All right? <laughs> 10 people come up here. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Over here, have a seat. You're guilty. All right. Have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm Judge Brown of Pope County. Uh, who? Pope. Pope. P O P E. Like Pope Francis. Pope. <laughs> um, we are here today because the County of Pope has charged Ms. Francis Francesca second degree murder and the death of Dr. Smith. She has put a plea of not guilty. We have a DA and we have a defense case. How we're gonna run this is we're not gonna do any cross-examining, but I want you to figure out what's going on with this case and I want you to reflect back to what you wrote in your case reports to see if you can answer these questions appropriately, especially when it gets to EMS. It is all scripted except for the defenses to the EMTs. Because I just gave him the charts this morning and we figured out what we were gonna ask. So they don't even have the answers to that kind of stuff. And do you guys have answers that the DA has? Uh, give that to, give them to the EMTs so they know what your answers are to your questions. All right. Thanks. Mr. Schwico is my Counterpart of work, this is Captain Squeaker from the Philadelphia Fire Department. He's actually my EMS complaint officer, so this is a perfect thing for him. Mr. Squeaker, is the defense ready? Defense is ready, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Please, self defense. Self defense. Okay, okay. I wonder why he's in traffic. Mr. DA, are you ready, sir? We are ready. Thank you very much. All right. Mr. DA, will you please call your first witness? I'd like to call the police officer on the scene. It was the first time on the scene. Mr. Bailey, would you like to swear him in, please? Please, right. Swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And now. <laughs> Have a seat, sir. <laughs> Mr. D, would you like to get up and uh, cross examine this person, please? Can. Oh, you can do it. You can sit down. He's <laughs> old. He's Okay, sir, please state your name and your position. Uh, Detective Jones, and I'm with the small bill police department. Okay. And where are you working on the morning of Wednesday, October 14, 2015? Yes, I was. Did you respond to Dr. Smith's office at 123 North Broad Street that morning? Yes, I did. Okay, and what did you find? Uh, the doctor was lying on the floor. He was DOA for an apparent uh, gunshot wound or wound. Uh, Mrs. Francis was sitting in a chair uh, being cared for by the EMS. Detective Jones, are you a ballistic expert? No, I am not. Okay. And what, where did you send the ballistic evidence? To the National FBI lab in Virginia. Okay. Do you have that report? <coughs> I do. Okay. Um, I'd like under that as exhibit 2B. Copy. Thank you very much. Uh, I have no more questions. Officer, you may step down. Thank you very much. Okay, for my second one, just I like to call the coroner. Mr. Coroner, will you come up and swear in, please? Sir, would you please state your name? Dr. Goldsmith. And are you the coroner for Smallville? Yes. 
Did you examine the body of Dr. Smith and the evidence? Yes, sir. Okay. And what was the cause of death for Dr. Smith? Two, gun, two gunshot wounds fired at close range. The first was in the right upper chest, exited through the right back, upper right back. The second was to the lower left back without an exit wound. The second bullet hit the right ventricle of the heart and lodged inside. Dr. Smith died from the massive internal bleeding caused by the second gunshot. Okay. Were there any other markings on the body? Yes. Okay. And what were they? Several scratches on the right arm. And did you what did you determine them to be? Nail imprints. Okay. No more questions from the Mars. Carney, may step down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next witness, please. I call the witness. Okay. Yeah, the witness or the. Uh, <laughs> you want to do the EMTs first? EMTs. Okay, we'll do the EMT first. EMS number one. EMS number one. Welcome, well, sir. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Sir, right, there's your report that you may refer to. Sir, please state your name and position. Uh, John Petrich, DMT of Smallville EMS. Okay. And how long have you been involved in EMS? Uh, since 1992. Okay. Did you respond to 123 North Broad Street on October 15th? Yes. Did you pronounce a male victim dead there? Yes. Uh, how did he die? What appeared to be a gunshot wound to the upper right chest. Okay. And was Miss Francis the defendant? What was she doing? Uh, Nonverbal, sitting in a chair. What appeared to be lacerations on her, on her wrists. Okay. How many weapons did you find on scene? It appeared to be one semi-automatic handgun laying on the floor. Okay. Did you find any shell casings? I noticed two. My partners noticed three. Okay. You done? Yeah. Okay. Mr. EMT, you may step down for a moment. Thank you very much. The, uh, I'd like to call number two, EMS <laughs> Yes, sir. Okay. Please state your name and position. Marina Cameron, EMT. Okay. Do you work for Smallville EMS? Yes. How long have you been involved in EMS? Eight years. Did you respond to 123 North Broad Street on October 15th? Yes. Did you pronounce a male victim dead there? Yes. How did he die? Gunshot. Okay. What was the defendant, Mrs. Francis, doing? She was sitting in the chair. She looked uh, upset. She was shaking. She was not speaking. She was sort of rocking back and forth. How many weapons did you find on scene? One handgun, one knife. Okay. Did you find any shell casings? Three. I have no further questions for you. You may step down for a moment. Thank you very much. Whew, that was easy. <laughs> Yeah, you have any more witnesses? I'd like to call. <coughs> okay. Francis. Okay, for the record, please state your name. This is Francesca Francis. And where are you at 123 North Broad Street on the morning of October 14, 2015? Yes. And what were you doing there? Um, Dr. Smith is my psychologist. I had an appointment with him. Did you shoot Dr. Smith? Yes, um, but... Stop right there, Your Honor. I yes. have more questions for you. All right, please have a seat. <laughs> Obviously, there was no cross examination required. <laughs> Very short in the answer. Mr. DA, are you done with your questions at this time? I am at this time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Schwico. Yes, sir. You're your first witness, please. I'd like to call back up the police officer. Sure, no problem. Uh, how many years have you worked as a police officer? According to this test. Three. Did you find it? Found two weapons. And what were they? Uh, a small handgun and a knife. 
And uh, do you know who owned the knife? Dr. Smith's uh, prints were on the knife uh, that matched the set uh, after we compared it to a set in his kitchen. And were you able to determine who owned the gun? Uh, all the markings uh, were removed from the weapon, but uh, Mrs. Francis' prints were found on Okay, thank you. No further questions at this time. You may step down, sir. Thank you very much. I'd like to recall the coroner. Okay, Mr. Coroner. Still on the roof, yet? Yes, you're still on the roof. Mr. Coroner, sir, how long have you been a uh, coroner? 23 years. Is this your full-time position? Yes, I'm a county employee. <coughs> you said that the cause of death was a gunshot wound, is that correct? Yes, sir. And have you investigated other gunshot victims? Yes, over 100. Are you, also, are you a uh, expert in ballistics? Yes, I monitor it in ballistics. Minor in ballistics. You can monitor it too, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> and how many shell casings did you find on the scene? Three. What caliber were they? Nine millimeter. Did they match uh, the gun that was found on scene? Yes. Um, were you able to determine uh, who shot Mr. Smith? The Dr. gun. Go ahead. Dr. Smith. <laughs> the gun was unregistered, but we found powder Man. burns and gun sh gunshot residue mm -hmm. on uh, Mrs. Frank. Thank you. No further questions. You may step down. Thank you very much. That's the five in the space list, EMT number one. He, he named the space list, EMT number one. Here we go. That's for that. We'll determine his uh, level of training in a moment. <laughs> and uh, you an EMT or a EMT, sir? EMT, sir. And how many years have you been at in the EMT? Since 1992. Uh, see the defense or the uh, prosecutor's exhibit there. The I did. Chart. That the chart you prepared? Unfortunately, yes. I don't think that's a good thing to say. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, you indicate there was a gunshot wound to the back. How were you able to determine that? That it was an exit wound. The hole appeared larger, sir. Are you a, a ballistics expert? I am not. Um, you also identified them as nine millimeter shell casings on the floor. It appeared to be okay. Semi-automatic. That I did write nine millimeter. Okay. Were you able to determine that they were nine millimeters? No. You could read the. Caliber on the no, that's what I said. It would, what appeared to be. Like, All right, didn't say it was. No further questions. Great. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I can call EMS worker number two. Stand again. Come on down. <laughs> You're still sworn in. Still required to tell the truth, tell the truth, and talk about the truth. And uh, maybe, uh, are you an EMT or a paramedic? EMT. And how many years again have you been in EMS? Eight. Eight. And did you prepare that chart that's before you? The novel, yes. <laughs> um, may I see that for a moment, please? You documented that the, there was an exit wound on the patient? That there appears to be one appears entrance, to be one. one exit. Okay. And how did you determine that the one was an entrance and one was an exit? Well, I didn't say it definitely was. I said it appears. Um, I don't know the well, way for okay. sure. What would make it appear to be? Just to, because there was more than it, one? It almost seemed like they were aligned, so the trajectory one way come back out the other way. That's for introductory. No. Trajectory. <laughs> Geometry, trajectory, whatever. <laughs> None of the above. Okay. So they could both be entrance on the fence with no bullets exiting the patient? That's possible. And 
It also stated that the female appears to have shot the patient. Uh, were you on scene at the time of the shooting? No. How did you determine the, the female shot the male? Because it appears I'm not sure, because normally people, if they shoot themselves, they do not shoot themselves in the chest or the back. And she was very distraught, appearing something had happened involving her. Could there have been a third party on the scene at the time of the shooting? That's possible. There was no evidence available, nothing looking, showing that possibility. You also state that the patient cut herself? Uh, that Ms. Uh, Francis? I uh, said it, uh, well, I said that she made hesitation cuts on her wrist. Okay, how did you determine that? Poor observation skill. <laughs> it was not a deep wound. You may step down. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a hot seat. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. And, Last but not least, Ms. Francis, may you, will you please, uh, hey, Ms. Francis. I'm okay, just scared. All right. And were you under Dr. Smith's care? Yes. For? Depression. Did he place you on any medication? Yes. And how long have you been under Dr. Smith's care? Uh, about six weeks. I see him once a week. Thank you. Tell the uh, court what happened in his office on October the 14th. I arrived for my appointment and he poured me a glass of wine saying it would help me relax about maybe 20 minutes into the session. Um, he approached me and made some sexual advances. I tried to fight him off, but he pulled out a knife and in the struggle, he cut my arm. I feared for my own life, so I pulled the gun I had in my purse out and shot him. And do you recall how many times you fired the gun? I don't remember. Thank you, no further questions. Defense first. Thank you very much. All right. Let's talk about this whole thing. First of all, jury. Do you think EMS was an asset to this case to, for the DA and or the defense? Seriously? Yes or no? Maybe I'm a They're not forensic experts. What's this? They're not forensic experts. All right, that's good. They're not forensic experts, so you shouldn't be talking about that in any report. All right, what else? First rule of hold, you begin one stop ticking. Okay, yeah, we'll talk about wounds in a couple minutes. <laughs> Anything else? Now, yeah, joke, here they were joking, right. you know, they were talking about, yeah, unfortunately I wrote the report or whatever else the comments were made. If you do that in court, you're obviously that's very unprofessional, number one. And number two is you're going to lose your entire case because of any comment you make like that. So you got to remember when you're in court, I know this is a little off key, but you need to be really serious and professional at all times. So obviously EMS wasn't much of a help for anybody all right, because of the documentation stuff. All right. Anybody else in the crowd? Any other comments about the EMTs or anything else? Did you see what actually happened here? The, the story was that Ms. Francis was a manic depressive. She was being seen by Dr. Smith, all right? He had medicated her. Dr. Smith started having some feelings for this young lady. So on the sixth or seventh visit at his office, he poured her a glass of wine saying, here, this will help you relax so you can talk more. And being a doctor, she totally agreed with him, and that's why you found the spilled liquid on the ground, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then somewhere <coughs> in the session, he started coming on to her sexually, physically assaulting her. He's the one that pulled the knife out and split her wrist. He did that for two reasons. A, number one, to take control of her, and B, number two, to make it look like she was suicidal. And you guys, all you saw was a slit wrist and a knife below the wrist. And I guarantee you, 99% of you assume she slit her own wrist. See how you can twist things around and you really can't say those kind of things? So stating facts, that she had a laceration to her wrist. I mean, you can describe it length and how much bleeding and all that kind of stuff. And a knife was found here. 
The other interesting point was the knife was found on her left side. She's right hand dominant. So if she would have cut herself, the knife would have dropped on the right side, not necessarily the left side. All right, and then one point is I actually had the knife pointing the other direction. Unfortunately, when we put blood on it, it got turned around. So the handle was actually pointing the other way. So it would show that maybe somebody else, because you won't drop the knife and the handle will be away from you. See what I'm talking about? If she cut herself and just let it drop, it would drop with the knife pointing towards her. No, the knife should have been pointing away from her kind of stuff. So, I mean, the opposite kind of stuff. Um, she, there was pills there. All right, now the question is, why was the pill bottle outside of the purse? Did he, the doctor, give her more pills? Did he put something in her drink as opposed to his drink? Um, that, again, you just want to state, that it was pill bottles were found there, whatever, open, closed, whatever you found, just state a fact. She, they could have come out of her purse when she pulled the gun out because it was in a rapid fire motion kind of stuff, all right? Now, Let's talk about the gunshot wounds here, guys. Oh, and first of all, there were three casings. She hit Dr. Smith twice. And some things you have to start looking for in this. The blood covered up some of it, but if you looked around the edge of it, you'll actually see there's burn marks, which probably means this was fired at less than 10 feet away from the patient. I, and there was actually some powder burns around there. You can't see them too well because the blood's covering some of it. Um, but let's talk about wounds. First of all, I, I'd say 90% of you, actually more than 90% of you, automatically assume all the wounds were gunshots. You can't say that on the report. I don't care if a gun's there, unless somebody told you I shot somebody or I saw somebody being shot, they're wounds, period. You're not an expert. How do you know the gun actually caused the wounds? So you stated it was a gunshot wound could really screw up the case. So you mark him as wound one, upper right chest, powder burns found, period. That's not, however they got there, that's not for you to determine. Wound two, larger, you can say it's larger than wound one, found in upper back right chest. You can't make any reference to an exit or an entrance wound. And I talked about this the other day about that's what screwed up the Kennedy's case because they're still arguing which was the exit wound and which was the entrance wound. And not all entrance wounds are small. Depends on the caliber of the gun, the angle, the skin. There's 190,000 things to look for. The one that killed him was he eventually, when he got shot in the chest, he turned away and started running away from her. That's why he was in the opposite direction from she was. And he, she shot him once in the up middle, left back. The trajectory went up and hit his heart. And that's what actually killed him. So that would be wound number three. Middle, left, back, chest. Period. Wound. Don't call them gunshots. Does that make any sense to you guys? All right. Um, and again, you don't even know the gun on the ground's real. Do we? It could have been a handgun, it could have been a BB gun, and she was shot with a nine millimeter. So again, don't, you, got, you can't make accusations and don't make opinions. I think, I think, I think, should never be in any case report you write. You only state facts. What appears to be a, you know, small caliber or a small handgun laying on the floor, blah, blah, blah. You can put down where you found it, you know, you know how many casings. I don't even like talking about number of casings. If there's multiple casings, I just say multiple casings. Because most of you only put down two. The third one was a little harder to see. I did that on purpose. So you don't even know how many times the person was shot. And the people that saw three casings probably think all three wounds were caused from each casing, which is another possibility. So there could have been three entrance wounds, one in the front and two in the back, and that's not for us to determine. See where all that all fits in when you go to court kind of stuff? Um, overall, I thought most of the charts were very good, by the way. And I actually gave the class like an A minus kind of a deal. Nobody really hit a home run. There was a couple people pretty close. Um, and again, I talked about yesterday, life does not mean good or bad. Because if you write something in a report, this guy is going to find that and go, you know what, I'm going to use this against them for my client. 
because you have to write too much stuff. All right? Sometimes keeping it simple but factual and straightforward is sometimes the way to go. And again, it depends on the circumstances, but length does not mean it, it, it's a good thing. And shortness definitely doesn't mean it's a good thing because there wasn't enough information. Um, there was a, you know, it was really funny when I read it. I, I could actually tell what part of the state you guys ran out of. Seriously, because there were so many different formats. I don't have a problem with that. My issue is a lot of them were very disorganized. Like you jump from point A to point B and you mix patient one and patient two sometimes. And like that can be really confusing when you go to court. Because you may read one line and uh, you're, you're going to be, you, believe me, in a real court you're going to be nervous as hell. And you're going to read that one line and it's actually about patient number two, not patient number one because you forgot that you mixed things up a little bit, all right? Some of you did really well, some of you actually walked down victim number one and wrote a paragraph, victim number two, you wrote a paragraph, crime scene, whatever. Um, there's a charting mechanism out there, it's called CHART, C-H-A-R-T, that covers OPQRST, HPI, the whole nine yards. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can Google CHART, C-H-A-R-T, it's an excellent way to document, all right? Um, I'm a real big fan of that. And I'm not going to change how you document, I'm just making a recommendation for you to look at something different. Especially when it comes to a crime scene or an MCI that you have multiple patients and all that kind of stuff, you sometimes have to look at those kind of things. Um, we just talked about the gunshot wounds, blah, 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 and some exits, uh, powder burns. Nobody said anything about the front chest that they thought they saw powder burns on it. And again, it wasn't the best of scenarios, but you know, we, we, we had it done. Um, a lot of you made a lot of good comments about, I made the desk with a lot of details. If you noticed, I had her chart out, her appointment was in his appointment book. I had a lot of things in there. Most of you actually recognize that the cell phone kept ringing. That could be an important key for lots of different reasons, and I'm not even going to go into the variables there. But you noticed, and you put it in your report, the cell phone was in, in a face down position, didn't touch it, excellent. Um, well, you couldn't anyway because it was past the line. But the whole point about you made mention of it, it was, that was a very good observation. And we did that on purpose. You know, those can be actually distractors to you as you are in this crime scene. So you really don't want to be distracted by a phone, somebody screaming, and then you walk on some blood and you, you trip on a, on, a, on a casing or something like that and really screw up the entire scene. So we wanted to throw a couple of distractors in there for you. Um, let me see here. This is interesting. The spilled wine. Everybody in the room thought it was spilled wine. Why? Because the wine bottle was on the desk. You can't assume anything. It's spilled liquid from a glass on the floor. You can describe it, purple, red, blue, whatever color it was. Then you can make mention that there was a wine bottle found with, you know, in, with an open container or whatever on top of the desk. But you can't assume because the wine bottle was in the desk, it was wine in the glass. Does that make any sense? You know what I'm saying? You, you sometimes got to look outside and stop making like, Ooh, you know, she cut herself. Oh, there's a bottle of wine. Oh, there's a bottle of pills. They're hers. The pills may not be hers. That's fine. Just leave it, period. Found a bottle of pills next to her purse, whatever it was. Um, and everybody said it was wine of some sort, or it appeared to be wine. You know, just make it fluid, liquid, whatever the case may be. Um, the knife direction, we already talked about that. One person in the room actually made a diagram of the incident. I don't have a problem with that. Um, you, you should, you can do that, you can't do that. If you really can't describe it, you just gotta watch that you don't put something in the wrong spot on your diagram, because that'll really hurt you. Like if you put the gun on the opposite side of the body, because you just remember that's where it was, that diagram is gonna be used. And the problem is, this guy is gonna take the coroner's report and take the EMS report and try to find inconsistencies to get his client off. Because he's going to say they died of uh, stab wounds, and you already mentioned in the report it was gunshot wounds. Well, who's right here? See what I'm talking about? And he's going to rip that apart. Like, well, aren't you an expert? You're a certified EMT in the state of Pennsylvania. You're considered an expert. So you really got to watch what you write, because this guy here is gonna, could rip it apart. 
Same thing with a diagram. You've got to be really careful like how you do that kind of stuff. Um, and last but not least, there was a lot of opinions still put in there. We talked about a few of them up here. You know, I think it was a nine millimeter. I think she cut herself. Um, I believe it was alcohol. I believe this, I believe that kind of stuff. Stop writing I believe. You should never put I believe on anything in the report. State facts, car is red, gun on floor. This, whatever the case may be, that is it. <coughs> Does that make any sense? All right. Is there any questions? Oh, let me see what else I have here. Those are the exit wounds. The one in the top right is technically the exit wound from the one in the front, yes. Because, yeah, most of the time they are bigger, but not necessarily true. And the one in the lower left is the one that she shot him, and that's actually what killed him. The trajectory hit his heart on the way in, and he died from that wound. He would have survived the one wound on the front of his chest, but that's what really took him out. There's the knife with the blood on it. Uh, good marking. Most people put that down. Knife on floor, uh, blood fell from the knife. There's the appointment book with her appointment and the right date and the time. There's some notes that he had. The doctor had written about the, the appointments of the folders he had in line. If you noticed, he wrote that he was seeing Mrs. Smith, blah, 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 right down the line. And all those folders were right next to him. Now, that could be important. If he came on to her, how many other females did he come on to? So that's not your issue, but if you make those documentations that blah, 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 well, the police are gonna make those notifications and look, look into that kind of stuff. Um, there's a spill liquid in the pills on the ground, and again, just make it spill liquid, glass, film, floor, whatever. There's the wrist laceration, which was not self-inflicted. The doctor actually did that. There's a picture of the crime scene overall and all the details, the cell phone and everything on the, on the thing. I think that's basically it. All right. Any questions? I hope that this... Go ahead. Go ahead. D uh, Mr. D D DA rebuttals the charges. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the finds a DA guilty. Keep that one quick story. Yes, go ahead. All right. It, it's just not just even documentation. It, it's your observations on the scene that can make a difference. <coughs> my partner and I get called to a house, an apartment actually, first thing in the morning. Dead woman on the floor. Guy in the apartment says, "Take this girl, another girl up at the bar last night. Brought back to his place. Those two were doing drugs, shooting up." Wakes up this morning, other girl's dead. The one girl's dead, the other girl's gone. So uh, we start to do an exam on her. Now she was well fed, you know, not your typical IV drug user. So we're looking at her, put her on our life pack 10 to show you how far back this was, <laughs> to obtain our three, our uh, a systole to staple to our state chart, which again shows you how long ago this was. And we go to put the EKG on her chest. And her bra is pulled up above her breasts. Fashion statement? Probably not. Ladies, I don't know if that's more comfortable to wear them that way. Don't know personally. But again, the alarms are going off. <laughs> She's wearing like a, a, a turtleneck. So just for the heck of it, because sometimes people who shoot drugs do it in the neck, pull down the collar. In her neck, so it's an impression of an electrical cord. It was a polarized electrical cord for those who know the difference. It's got the little ridges on the side. You can see the ridges in the impression. This guy is getting himself dressed, making himself breakfast. So it's like, we give the whole explanation. Cop finally shows up, thank goodness, we're saying, oh yeah, you know, the guy in the other room making himself breakfast, you know, pick these two girls up and meanwhile we're showing him the neck wounds and things like that. See him later on, apparently this guy had been Wanted in California for murder as well. He confessed to this one, confessed to one in California. And if we had just said, oh yeah, you know, he picked these two girls up, they were doing drugs, probably overdosed, he may have left the scene and been gone again. Who knows? But because we learned the cop, you know, as soon as we showed him the neck wound, the hands on the gun, he's calling for backup, and uh, hopefully we prevent another murder. Back to you, Your Honor. No problem. And again, you can make a difference out there. 
So I hope over the last two days you picked up a few pointers. And you know, I'm not here to change how you document, but I want you to be more aware of how you document. Um, again, I've been to court numerous times. I see my, I have to look at the charge before the people go to court. So I see all them, and believe me, our medics and EMTs in the city of Philadelphia go to court quite a bit. Believe me, uh, I, I can tell you on a daily basis, we have at least one or two people in EMS at court every day. So in some days we had three, four, and five people there, depending on the day of the week. So we have a lot of court cases in the city because everybody in the city wants to sue somebody. So I'm just showing you that there's a lot of experience you can learn from us today, and I hope it was worth your while, and thank you very much. Have a nice day.